Okay, living by the gospel. We Christians should be doing this. We Christians don't do this. That's what Gandhi said. And he was right. That's what he said. The one thing that I do not understand on the Christ, on, in Christianity is why Christians don't follow Christ. And we don't fall, not necessarily we here, I'm talking about Christianity in general. The reason why we don't follow is because we look into something else. We don't look at Christianity as we should. It is very challenging to uh, live by the gospel in a society, especially in the Western civilization, where when I look at the news, I see something that I don't find in the gospel. I see people killing people, I see shooting, massive shootings, we see you know, a lot of different things that shouldn't be even we shouldn't have to deal with them. But they are part of our society, and we are part of the society. So we as Christian spiritists, we have to live with both. Because when I look into one side, the news are what we know what they are. When I look into the other side, I have a whole set of instructions and books and, you know, whatever you want to call it, information in general about Christianity and how to live by the gospel. So there's like a gap, there's a, like a, a tremendous difference here, and we are all down here. So the thing is, some of us are looking towards that side. Some of us are looking towards this side. And if you're looking at that side, automatically you can't be looking at this side, because it's either or, either I'm looking this way, or I'm looking that way. So when I choose a side to look at, I forgot about the other, automatically. The problem is we, we, we look into this side, but we know we want to look into that side. That generates a lot of conflict. And that's how we, we want to bring up today, discuss today, is how do we deal with this thing? And why is there such a gap between these two things? And how do I fill up the gap myself? Because it's, you know, in, in my own favor. How do I get this thing going in my favor? That's the goal for tonight. So, uh, the question for Christians is, in the current 2014 Orlando, where does the gospel fit? Because nothing that it's out here, out there, is in the gospel. So how does it fit things, right? If we go back to the basics, we know that uh, from the supreme intelligence, there are two principles, okay? One is going to define the laws of the material world, and the other defines the laws of the moral world. If I want to learn about material world, I have to study things like those, biology, science in general, archaeology, all these things. And I can't learn it all in one life. There is no time to do that, so I need to come back a bunch of times, because I need to learn all of that. If we're all going to go to angelitude one day, if we're going to be angelical one day, I need to know everything. And I can't know everything in one life, so I need to come back several times. If I want to learn on this side, moral world, this is the source, the gospel, okay? For us, the gospel according to spiritism. So each one of these things is going to teach something different. But for us, uh, angelitude means how to integrate the two wings of the knowledge, okay? That's how we want to end up. Now, for the spirits, uh, for the spiritists, us, where exactly does the gospel fit? Spiritism starts with the Spirit's book, as we know, 1857. And this is a series of uh, 1,009 questions. And Alain Kardec divides this in, in, in parts. There's one question in the book in which he's going to ask, what is the most perfect type that I want to follow? Because if there is such a thing, I want to follow him. I want to do what he did. I want to, first of all, understand what he did and why he did. And I want to follow. I want to be in his steps. Now, that's not the only connection between these two things. If you look into the Spirit's book, it's actually a set of four books, if you will. The last two books, The Moral Laws and Hopes and Consolations, it, these last two books are detailed, but in really deep details into the Gospel according to Spiritism. So Alain Kardec, when he's going to detail those last two books, because of the answer he got, th think about yourself being Alain Kardec. So you ask the question, who is the most perfect type? And the answer comes, and it's Jesus. I am an Kardec. What do I want to do? I want to know everything about him. 
I want to know everything about what he did, what he didn't do, and why. Where is the source of information? The source of information is the Bible. This is 1857. There is no other source of information. So what does Allan Kardec do? He dives into the Bible. And he's going to extract all the possible information he can. As he's doing this, he starts getting, collecting answers and, and instructions from the spirits as he was going along. And he appends these informations to, throughout the chapters in the Gospel of, According to Spiritism. So the Gospel According to Spiritism contains a lot of information given to us by sp uh, spirits, superior spirits. So that's how we spiritists relate into this whole confusion and the whole society that we are in. And how did we put the hands on this Bible. Kardec goes to the Bible to bring up the information. How this, how does this thing make its way into our hands? It all starts with Jesus himself, you know, walking and preaching, and people following him. So if you're there, you, you just listen to him. You're watching him and listening to him. That's how it all starts. And then it goes into verbal tradition. For example, Jesus is talking over there in that city. I couldn't be there, but somebody was there, and they told me, oh, he's spoke about this and this and this, or he did this and this and this. So verbal tradition, just like today. Okay, you hear something, somebody else is going to tell you, and it goes like that. Now there's a point where the first generation, those who actually lived with him, or you know, were uh, uh, incarnated at the time, they know they're going to die, everybody's going to die, and if we don't write the information down, who's going to tell the next generation what happened, and how he was, and why? So we feel the need to start writing things, you know, to leave a legacy behind. So that's how the manuscripts come about. Now these manuscripts, they are things like this. You, you see these symbols here. This is a Greek manuscript. And uh, uh, one of these Gospels, for example, is like 300 pages of this thing. Now think about this. We are all well-educated. In these days, only 5% of the population can read and write. We are all now educated. If I give you three pages of this thing, including myself, I'm going to make mistakes. Can you imagine, in these days, people trying to copy this thing because there is no press, printed press, there is no internet. The only way to get the information from this uh, congregation, per se, to another congregation is somebody comes in here and says, I see you got the book, can I have it for a week or two weeks or whatever, so I can copy it. That was done in the very beginning by volunteers in the congregations. These volunteers, supposedly, they knew a little bit how to read and write, but they were not professionals. They were not people who could do impeccably. So we feel the need to have this done by professionals. These professionals, or copyists, uh, as we call today, they are what we know as scribes. This is what a scribe is. A scribe is a professional that's going to copy manuscripts and texts. If you go back to the Gospels, you see a lot of clashes between scribes and Jesus. Look at how interesting this is. Right? They don't like Jesus. They don't like what he's saying. They don't like what he's bringing up, what he's showing. But they are the ones who are going to translate the information. Isn't that very contradictory? So there's a lot of personal touch in these copying. And again, from one copy, you can make another copy with one person. That copy, if there's something wrong on that copy, that copy can generate 10 more. The other 10 are going to be wrong. Out of the 10, one can generate 50 wrong, and so and so and so. And you put this in a span of almost 2,000 years, you can have a lot of complications in there. Plus translations. So copying is just part of the problem. Translation is, is another. Translation is terrible. I always give this example. Uh, hopefully most of you know either Portuguese or Spanish, but for example, let's say that I get the, fo the following phrase in English. My friend is here, okay? And I'm supposed to translate this, let's say in Spanish, okay? The word friend in Spanish, that there is no such a word in, in, in Spanish for that. It's either a man or a woman. It's in the word. So I would have to say something like this. Mi amigo está aquí, or mi amiga está aquí. By the time that I do this translation for you, I interpret it for you. And that translation can be a disaster, depending on the context. It could be a total disaster. And the other way around, if I get the following phrase in Spanish to put into English, mi amigo, a man, está aquí. 
then I translate it to English and it becomes my friend is here. So you lost half of the information because you don't know if it's a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. This is one phrase, one simple thing. <laughs> you see the size of the problem. And you put this into a 2,000 year span, it becomes a problem. So how do we deal with this? Because we Christians read the same Bible. And this Bible has been translated and translated many times, interpreted. Well, one way to see this is here. If we look at this map, this is a map of the Roman Empire all over here. Uh, you can see the northern part of the empire here, and here the east part. This is a map dated approximately 200 years after Jesus. Okay, What this shows, is, you see some colors here, what this shows is where each gospel was predominant. This is very interesting because let's say, for example, that somebody comes to me and say, I want you to write something about a man who died several years ago. Let's say Elvis Presley, 40 years ago. Okay, so somebody comes to me and says, can you write something really quick about Elvis Presley? And I say, yeah, but my first question is, who's going to read it? Because if they are 60, 65 years old, that's one thing. If they are 15, 20, that's another thing. Completely different. Although it's about the same man, the same person. So when a writer writes something, he has an audience in mind. When Matthew, okay, or uh, Mark, as we see here, right? When Mark is writing to uh, his gospel, he's writing to an audience. He's writing to the people right outside Judea over here where you see the color code, right? These people are not straight Jews. They are on the boundaries. They are just outside Judea. So you can't tell a lot about Judaism values because they will not understand, okay? And then you have... Uh, Matthew, which is the very Jewish gospel, okay, Matthew is the green part here, it's written for Jews living in Judea, which is different from, you know, other people in other places. And then you have two more covering different areas, you have Luke and you have John, and if you look, for example, let's say a guy in Rome here, okay, so a guy in Rome is reading, let's just say he's reading John, okay, and somebody here is reading Matthew. So if these guys ever, you know, meet each other, they're going to say, oh, this Christianity thing is great. Yeah, Jesus said that. And the other guy's going to say, no, he didn't say any of that. He said this. You see, they're not contradicting. They are just reading things that were written for different audiences. So just by looking at these four Gospels in these geographical areas, you can tell that Christianity in Rome is not the same Christianity in Jerusalem or North Egypt and different places of the empire. So we start seeing the possibility okay, for several Christianities out of the same source. And that's exactly what happened. This is the year 200. And you put this in time and you know multiply by the number of years. So there's going to be a point where we don't know who is reading what anymore. Now, we here today are not interested in the audience of each writer, of each uh, evangelist. We are interested in the audience of Jesus. He said something. These people wrote down what he said for a certain group of people, but I'm not interested in that group of people. I want to see what he said. Okay. So when I go back to Jesus, I ask him, what is the audience? What is his audience? Who is he talking to? And then he will say strange things that don't make any sense to us, okay? In, in principle, love your enemies. So, think about this. Jesus comes over, go back to his days, and he tells us here, love your enemies. The common understanding is, okay, let me find his address. I'm going to go there, knock on his door, hug him, and say, I love you so much. For in those days, that's exactly what he means. It, it's a physical thing. And things like a be perfect. I can't fail, I can't do anything wrong. That's the interpretation. I have to be very careful. Abandon father, mother, and so others. Okay? And this kind of, it's a challenge for these people. They don't understand. Now, for us, what do we have to understand? We have to know who is Jesus talking to. You see, Jesus is not talking to Peter, the fisherman. He is talking to an immortal spirit who happened to have the name Peter, and he was a fisherman in those days. 
he was talking to an immortal spirit whose name was Matthew and had a job, tax collector. He's not talking to Matthew the man, the physical body, no. He's talking to immortal spirits. Anything that we read in, in spiritism, anything, anything that we read and we try to understand has to be understood by us as this. He is talking to immortal spirits. So love your enemies, it's a completely different thing when we are immortal spirits from the ana ana analytical point of view. And because of all this, we have today 41,000 denominations of Christianity. That's almost absurd because we all heard the same man, we all read the same book, and we end up like this. So something is not right. So when, when we try to place the gospel today, in 2014, where does it fit? It, it gets complicated right here. Because each one sees in a different way, each one reads in a different way, each one interprets in a different way. Okay, so that's the basic uh, understanding of how the thing starts to complicate. Now, if we go in history, trying to see the value of the gospel today, because that seems to be the problem. Where is the value of the gospel? It contains a lot of nice things, that's all it is. It's not, okay? If we go back in history, we saw that. It all begins with Jesus, then the first generation, then we start feeling the need to write things and copying things, then uh, the Christians can't really go out and, and, and study and understand because they were under tremendous pressure from Romans and Jews. By uh, 312, Emperor Constantine becomes, the, uh, when he became the emperor, he converts to the faith. So at least now you can breathe, at least you can put your head above the water, you don't have to hide anymore, at least that. And you know, it starts a little better, it goes better. Uh, in the year 325, the char uh, fathers of the church, they have this meeting, it's called Council of Nicaea. In this uh, congregation here, in this place, it was assigned, it was defined by one person, one person that we out of all the gospels that we had and we had a bunch of them okay we were gonna make four of them the official gospels and these are the four that we know today and when he was questioned why four if we have so many manuscripts and information and his answer was pretty straightforward well the earth is flat and has four corners that's it so that's why we have four gospels defined by one person with this mindset that's pretty sad, to say the least, right? Anyway, time goes by. Uh, we get into the Crusades where the Pope, Pope is that figure, supposedly, that's going to bring up the message, reinforce the message, you spread the message, the good message. And that's not what Pope Urban II does. He uh, convinces every single Christian to go down to Jerusalem to exterminate this uh, Islamic community. And when, when you see something like this, you question yourself, where is this in the gospel? It is nowhere. So what is the value of the gospel? Think straight, cold, no emotion. Cold, be cold, okay? Where is this in the gospel? Nowhere. What is the value of the gospel? None. It's not crazy to think about it if you go back to these days. Then we go into something that we know of uh, which is the Inquisition, and we do the same thing. Where is this in the Gospel? Nowhere. So, where is the value of the Gospel? What is it there for? If we're doing things that are not in there. Then, in the 1500s, early 1500s, uh, Martin Luther, uh, which belonged to the church, he, he, he goes out to the churches and he sees people selling salvation on the stairs outside. And he says, that's not written anywhere in the Gospel. And then that's how Protestantism is born. And just a side note, who sells salvation today? The Protestants. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't have anything to do with the religion. It's a matter of, I want the power. That's all it is. Okay? So, but you, you go through these things, then uh, uh, the scientific community starts showing up more vividly in, our, in, in the whole planet, in different points of the planet. Questioning the church. The church can't answer my questions. They don't have the answer for the simplest things. And the answer of the church is you can't ask. You can't ask. Don't ask. And it, it's very challenging for people willing to have the answers. They can't have it. 
So you see, as we go point by point here, the value of the gospel is like fading, disappearing within our society, within Christianity. Why is this written if we don't follow, if we don't do anything? And then in 1870, something happens, something interesting happens. The Pope uh, Pius IX signs off, he was the Pope himself, so he signs off a decree saying that the Pope does not fail. Infallibility, papal infallibility, that's how it's known. And that was just too much for certain people. That's 1870. When this event took place, a group of uh, priests in the city of Lerida in Spain, they, they were not really satisfied with the way things were going within the church. They belonged to the church. They were priests. So when this thing takes place, they say, that's too much. I can't take this anymore. This is not Christianity. This is not written anywhere, anywhere in any of the manuscripts. So we're going to look for something else. So they, uh, what they do is, well, this is 1870. There is this guy, he's well known, Professor Rivail in France. He's very well known, this guy. He wrote a book under another name, I think it was Alain Kardec. And his book was burned in the central uh, plaza in Barcelona, 300 copies. So he might have written something interesting because we couldn't even get to know what the book is. Let's see what this guy wrote. So what they do is, by then we had published already the Spirit's book, the Medium's book, and the Gospel. So these, this group of priests, they take these three books and they're going to study to criticize on the positive side, to understand and say, no, this can't be, this is all right. This is the only purpose, okay? So they get together with the books after their working day at night, as they were going along, things mysterious, things starts to happen. Spirits are going are showing up. They hear noises. They see things. They feel strange things. And they panic. So what they do is they go to the Spiritist Center in the city of Larida, explain all that I'm explaining to you, explain to the Spiritist Center people. And the people say, well, here's what we can do. We can come to the church on the days that you study and we'll be there with you explaining and see what's happening. So they start studying together inside the church after hours. Well, no wonder why they decided to become spiritists. And in 1874, they compiled a book and the book is called, I don't think there's a translation into English, but it should be something like Rome and the Gospel. And this book is very interesting because it, it was written by priests that became spiritists. So they go side by side. This is what, for topic by topic. For topic, this one, for example, this is the Catholic view. This is the spiritist view. And this is why they're different. Next topic, next topic. It's very interesting. It's a very interesting book. Even for us, because a lot of us had previous contacts with other religions. Some of us come from other religions. It's a very interesting book. This is 1874. Okay? So, why did I have to turn their heads to something else? Because they were asking the same thing I'm asking you. Where is the value of the gospel if this is happening? You know, the gospel is not telling us to do this. Or, it was just a, a piece of handwriting thing that has no value at all. And time goes by and we're still being challenged by the gospel. Now, when we take um, the Spiritist uh, view, okay, the Gospel according to Spiritism, the first phrase on the book is not in the middle of the book. The first phrase, the opening phrase, if you go out there and you pick up, you're going to see this. I just divide it into bullets, but it's a straight phrase with no changes whatsoever. Okay? The subject matter contained in the Gospels may be divided into five parts. The ordinary events of the life of Christ, the miracles, the prophecies, the words that the church used for his dogma, their dogma, and the moral teachings. And if you look at this thing here, like the first one, the events of the life of Christ, we're not interested in that. This is things like, did he die on a Thursday or on a Friday? I'm not really concerned about that. Was it, when he spoke, was he going up the mountain or down the mountain? It doesn't really impact me at all. It doesn't bring anything new. Number two, the miracles and the prophecies. Can you imagine Alan Kardec, who had his publications burned in the Barcelona? If he started by that, that would be the point of more conflict ever between 
Spiritism and Catholicism at the time. So what he did is he left the, the explanations on miracles and prophecies for the last book, which is the Genesis. Uh, number four, the dogmas of the church. That doesn't have anything to do with anybody except the church. And number five, the moral teachings. If you ask any scholar, anybody that has anything to do, theologists, scholars, 100% of them agree that this is intact. Even though we had all the translation problems, all the copying problems, all the, you know, deviation problems, you might bring us that one guy, one of the evangelists is going to say he was going up the mountain and the other is going to say he was coming down the mountain. That doesn't change the moral teaching. You know, a hundred percent of these scholars, they agree that the moral teachings was, were untouched. And this is the continuation on the phrase, on the first phrase of the spiritist, uh, Gospel according to Spiritism. Although the first four have been an object of controversy, controversy these, the last is untouched. Meaning, when we read this, or we go to the Bible, either, and we read the moral teaching, not what he's doing, if he's walking in barefoot or not, that doesn't matter to us. The moral teachings are intact. So, we know that we are reading is good. And then, uh, on two chapters down, Alan Kardec places uh, this thing here first. Very interesting. Imagine Earth as being sorted, a sorted district, a hospital, penitentiary, in an unhealthy region. Because it's all of these at once. And you will understand why afflictions overweigh joys. And then he says, this happens because one does not send healthy persons to a hospital. So hold on. This is a hospital. We don't send healthy people to a hospital. Is he saying that I'm sick? That's exactly what he's saying. But I'm going to argue. I'm going to say I'm not sick. Prove me wrong. Am I sick? We don't have to go very far. In the time of Jesus, we used to crucify 500 people a day. Is this a thing of normal people? Or? It, it's more like leans towards the crazy people, the sick people. Here's another one. The night of St. Bart. Okay, when in 1517 Protestantism was born uh, a few years later and that's about 70 years later the Catholic Church decided to play revenge and they killed a bunch of Protestants in the night of St. Bartholomew now the Catholic Church goes to the Crusades, the Catholic Church kills other Christians is, it, is this normal or these people are sick you see if you think about the concept, yeah, we sign peace agreements three times a year in our history today. It doesn't change anything. On the next morning, we're going to fight another country. So I sign a peace agreement with him. I can't fight with him for maybe six months, so let's fight here. That's the sickness that we're in. And here's another one. Cyberbullying, where we force people without ever seeing these people is so strongly uh, uh, concentrated we are so strongly concentrated that we cause people to kill themselves so these things are not normal these are people that should be in a hospital and these people are we are part of this thing i don't mean that we do this or this or this or this but we are part of the same thing we are here to learn so this is the hospital when we are sick, we go to the doctor, and the doctor is going to do what? He's going to look at us, and he's going to say, well, you need some medicine. And here's the medicine. Now, when he gives up, when we are really bad, you, you're still groggy, you can't still see very well, but he'll come to you, he'll come to you. And here's the medicine, it's called gospel. Okay? This is the medicine that's going to take us out of the sickness. Okay? Now, there's some interesting things here on the, on the label. Indications. Treatment of pitricardia, petrified heart. Interesting, I want to see inside it. I want to read the sheet, okay? Now, the medical sheet that accompanies a, a, a medicine has 15 items. It's a standard. It's 15 items. So we're going to go item by item and see what it says, because I'm very interested in this thing. Number one, presentation. 
How is it presented, right? Presentation is compatible with sight and hearing. That means you can read the book or you can listen to it on MP3 or iPhone or something. For use by children and adults. Okay, number two, composition. What's in it? Each drop of his medicine contains concentrates of love, charity, and forgiveness. Also contains two components of mercifulness. That's exactly what Jesus is bringing to us. Okay? Number three, information to the patient. This medicine is designed to act upon generalized diseases, especially the ones involving suffering and incomprehension. Why do we suffer? Because we don't comprehend. And this is going to target this. Okay? And here's more. Um, must be stored in a safe place of very easy access. Very easy access. When we need it, when we start suffering, there we go to seek the answers. Okay? Must be kept in its original packaging. However, it is not subject to physical parameters. The gospel does not recognize time and space. It's outside the time and space dimension. What he said then is valid in another place, for example, Orlando, Florida, in another time, for example, 2014. Okay? It transcends time. This medicine is developed and recommended in cases of petrified hearts. Technical information. The subcomponents of mercifulness in this medicine have demonstrated excellent synergy with vital processes in all patients. All other components act directly upon the heart and vital components of the organism. It is target to the heart. The gospel is target to the heart, but which heart? The immortal heart, the one that is held by the spirit. Jesus was talking to immortal spirits. The spread of charity throughout the bloodstream restores the sensation of great wellness thus leading the patient to better assessment of his or her self-esteem. As we start going into this thing and understanding more, we feel better. We, feel, we just feel better because things start to make more sense to us. We value ourselves more just because we are in contact with this thing. That's how profound it is. Five, recommendations. Petrified hearts, as we saw, generalized or localized pain and sufferings. General Localized pain is physical. For example, if I hit my arm here, it's going to hurt here in this point. It's not going to hurt my feet. It's going to hurt here. And that's localized. When, when we're not feeling well, we go to the doctor. The doctor is going to say, he's going to ask, what do you have? Well, I have a pain here. Well, here, where exactly? No, in this area. You can't really precise the area anymore. And when we are not really feeling well, we go to the doctor. He's going to say, what are you feeling? I'm not feeling well. Where is it? I'm just not feeling well. No, where does it hurt? Is that your stomach, your head? Ah, I'm not feeling well. You cannot even precise what part of the body it is. Why? Because it's generalized, it's in a perispirit. It's not in the physical body. If it's in the physical body, I can pinpoint where it is. If it's in the perispirit, I can't. Rebalance of energetic processes. So recommended for, you know, for us to restructure, uh, restructure our energy levels. Recover of trustfulness and wellness. That's what it is. Right? We feel better, just feel better. Alterations caused by undetermined substance uh, disturbance of the organism. This is, these are the processes of obsession. It's something that's not part of the organism, but still reflects upon the organism. It's, it's something that, you know, the me medical profession it still doesn't understand, okay, but it, because it comes from outside, it's in the perispirit. So this medicine is good for that. Number six, contraindications. Wow, there are contraindications. Look at that. Oh no, none. <laughs> this medicine is intended for universal usage with no restrictions whatsoever. Number seven, warnings. No, there are warnings. No, no. This medicine does not require medical prescription. Over the counter. Huh? Depending on the individual, this product can bring intense manifestation of well-being beyond the expectations of the patient. And that's what it is. If you deep go into this thing, you will feel it. Okay? It can lead the mind into states of deep reflection and meditation never expected 
by the patients. Because at certain times we go read something and it, it just hits us. And you go like, like a song, you know, sometimes a song doesn't get out of your mind for a little bit, for maybe a day or two. Certain passages on the gospel will hit us. And they will get us to think. The mind goes into a reflection and we stay there for a little bit. Certain patients might react with disturbing digestive symptoms because certain people can't digest that. It's not their time yet. It's the wrong time for them. Everybody's going to get there. So, you know, we, we just have to go along ourselves and we can help people, but we can't force them. For better results, allow time and persistency. We see that a lot. Uh, when people come in to the Spiritist Center, they'll come in and they'll take the Spirit's book. Next week, they come back and say, listen, I, I, I heard, or, or not I heard, I read and understood all the first study questions, but my life didn't change yet. That's not what it is, okay? It's a whole concept. Okay, those were warnings. Pregnancy and breastfeeding. This product is recommended especially for pregnant and breastfeeding women, women since it contains essential elements that help in the formation and development of newborn babies. You bring, bring your kid here to the youth group, okay? Uh, especially when they start at three, four. When they get to 18, they're gonna be completely different from the rest of their age group. Completely different. Other people will ask him, you're so different. You're so different than us. Because they are. They will have a completely different uh, comprehension of things. Each and every dose taken by the pregnant woman will be automatically absorbed by the individual in development, in the uterus. You see the mother or us as fathers, we can only teach what we know. If I don't know, I can't teach. So if I want to do a good job in being a good parent, if I want to pass the information along, I need to learn it first, which is beneficial for myself, of course. But I need to do that first for myself, and then I'll pass it along. Okay? Number nine, using infants. Both the security and efficiency of, this, of the components in this medicine have been demonstrated in all studies throughout the time. That's what I said. You put a kid, three, four year old, here in the center, when they are 18, 20, they will be different than the average. Number 10, interaction with other medicines. Simultaneously administration of passes, meditation and reflections, as well as frequent visits to favorable environments to the mind, tends to increase the efficiency of the medicine. If I read the gospel and I go to the bar, I'm not really doing anything good. So the, the environment that I am in and I proposed myself to be has to be compatible with this. I can't simply, yeah, let's read one chapter because I'm going to drink tonight. That's not what it is. Okay, number 11. Side effects. Whoa, side effects, wow. Uncommon processes originating from charity, love, and forgiveness may arise. These processes include sufferings to, due to lingering expurgations. What is it? When I start reading and getting into the thing and comprehend a little, little bit more, I'm going to suffer because I need to change. That's a conflict right there. People coming from other belief systems have a tremendous hard time, let's say, migrating or understanding that they have to leave what they have behind because it's not compatible with what they have to be in. Here's another one. Sensation of floating as a result of the absorption of the ingredients. What is floating? It's something that you read and you just feel well. Oh, that's it. It's floating. You read and you feel well. That's part of the wellness. Also, a great sens general sensation of lack of imprisonment. Because if you're under a belief system that's dogmatic, you're imprisoned. Because they told me to do it. Why? Because they told me so. And when you don't have to deal with these things anymore, you're liberated. Okay, we go to the next level in terms of conscious. Uh, moreover, there have been cases of patients who experiment exhilarating liberation and readiness. Those are the ones who have, in fact, understood the message. 
The patient may also, in certain cases, reveal very strong desire to market the medicine towards other individuals with similar symptoms. That's what we do. When we find it, we want to give a copy to everybody of the Spirit's book, the Gospel. No, you should read this. Mm -mm. No. We are not doctors. We're not doing this. We can tell them by showing who we are, how we do things. We can't simply, I bought this book for you because it's going to be good for you. That's not how we do. Okay? That's dogmatic. Spiritism is not dogmatic. Twelve, dosage. The minimum recommended dosage is one basic unit per day, subject, however, to free will. Meaning, I don't want to study today. Then I won't study. There's nothing dogmatic about it. Nobody's going to kill me. Nobody's going to do anything. Nothing is going to happen to me. It is my free will. Okay? The efficiency of the treatment is especially observed when a patient maintains discipline and regularity. That's why we come here every week. That's why we read the gospel. We do gospel at home every week. That's why we pray every day, two days, whoever. It's free will. Everyone is different. Okay? Super dosage. Ooh. Oh, there are no established limits. Look. No established limits for a maximum dose, except the ones related to the free will. I want to read one chapter today. Tomorrow I want to read five. It's okay. And the day after, I'm very tired. I can only read one paragraph. That's okay, too. All right? There is no preset limit. Elderly patients. Mm. Typically, elderly patients are more sensitive to this medicine. Additional support by a qualified technician, that's us in the center, is recommended during the initial phase of the treatment. What this means is, it's very common. We see this a lot. Let's say somebody... Age is in the mind, as we know. Okay, so just as an example, let's say somebody is 70 years old. Just to put a number so we can relate to what I'm going to say. I mean, I'm putting a concept, not a number. So let's say somebody walks in here, they think they're very old. And physically, they're 70 years old. And they start, you know, reading the medicine, and they start taking the medicine, and they understand what it is. And there might be a point, we see this a lot, where a few weeks out, or maybe a few months out, he will revolt, and he will say to us, why didn't I know about this before? Why wasn't I presented with this thing before? They revolt. And we need to be able to, we volunteers in the center, we need to be able to deal with that. Because if we don't have the answer, that's dogmatic. We have to be able to deal with this. Okay? We see a lot of this in elderly, elderly in the mind. People, some people, they come in here, at 30, and they'll say the same thing. Why didn't I was presented with this before? As if they were, you know, they had another one day on earth. So it all depends on the mind. Doctor in charge, Jesus of Nazareth, certification, master modern guide. Expiration date? No, never. That's the medicine. Now, we read the medicine sheet. Okay, but reading the sheet is not enough because we read three sheets in the past. Okay, we read a sheet that was imposed on us because we didn't have any idea of how to deal with that, so it was imposed. The second sheet, the second medicine, was brought to us as a based on counseling. This is what you should do. I'm not condemning you. I'm not going to do anything if you don't want to do. But I'm suggesting you to do this. And the third one, that spiritism, the third revelation, explains why. You see, one thing is, you go to the doctor, he looks at you and say, you're going to take this medicine. Okay, I can take it. And the other thing is, he can say, you better take this medicine because it's going to help him, you know, do this and this and this, but also, you know, change your habits and so and so. That's counseling. Or he can say, I'm going to explain why you need to take this medicine. When you tell me you can't kill, that's different than when I know why. Okay? So reading the sheet is not enough. We need to do something with it. We need to make good use of the medicine. And again, you go to a, a, a doctor, a real doctor in the hospital, he gives you medicine, you might say, I'm not going to take that. It's free will. Okay? There is, nothing is imposed. 
Now, one thing we need to understand is we cannot simply live with the gospel as long as it doesn't disturb my interests. So now the, the gospel is marvelous, beautiful, but this thing about love your enemies, let's leave that chapter out because it's complicated. We can't do this. It's as is. You can't take uh, like a Tylenol and separate. I want this ingredient, but I don't want that. You can't do that. It's a whole thing. You take the whole thing. Right? The, uh, and here again, you see the laws of God, they're not obstacles. They are when we don't understand, then they become obstacles, but they are not. So let's go through some real conclusions. The gospel is, it brings us this idea that is our transforming tool. It's what's going to take us from way in the past into a brighter present and future, in terms of new incarnations from now on. It is our manual of personal evolution. It is written what I have to do to not be coming back and do the same thing but to come back in a better condition and then come back again in a much better condition and then one day don't come back at all. It is religiousness without dogmatism. There is no dogma in spiritism. You're not going to say, you've got to do this. Otherwise, you're not spiritist. There is no ID, spiritist ID. There's nothing like that. Okay? Because there is no dogma. I can't say, you're one of us because you do this. He is not because he doesn't. There is no such a thing. Okay? And finally, it is this prescription, this medicine for the soul. So these are things that the gospel brings to us. And I told you about this book. That's the book that the priests wrote. In this book, we all should read this book, all spiritists. But there's one phrase in this book. That it's one of these phrases that we put in the head, in the mind. We go to the pillow every night with that because it is so strong. This phrase is, this is written by priests, ex-priests, theoretical spiritism is a philosophy. Practical spiritism is a virgin. What is theoretical spiritism? I read Andre Louis six times. I read the Spirit's book 14 times. I read the Gospel 29 times. And I'm able to tell you which word is in which page and paragraph. Okay. All right. What does it have to do with a virgin? Nothing. It's the intelligent principle that converts the philosophy into a virgin. It's not a book. A book can do that. Because a book is not an intelligent principle. This is very strong. This is very strong. So if we take this every night to the pill, it bothers. In the beginning, it does bother. But you know, it's a transforming tool. As we transform, wellness pops in. And that's how we start changing. So four things so we, to wrap up what we discussed today. First of all, Jesus was talking to a moral spirit. He was not talking to a fisherman. He was talking to a moral spirit that was a fisherman in that lifetime. Salvation, meaning getting to the right way towards angelitude, is not when you get to Damascus. Once you get there, that's when you start. That's Damascus is not a destination point. Our Damascus is the gospel. We didn't face the gospel and, oh, that's it, I got it. That's when I start. That's my starting point. Before that, I wasn't even started. So that's when I'm really going to have to concentrate and from now on, I'm going to make this medicine my tool. So if we ask in Christianity, what does the gospel teach? We're going to have 41,000 different answers because we have 41,000 denominations of Christianity. So it depends on the belief system. For us, spiritists, what does it mean? What, what should we understand? What does the gospel show us? Okay. Here are some of them. It teaches love, charity, fraternity, forgiveness, uh, responsibility, mercifulness, and a bunch of other things. So pick, for, for example, something such as mercifulness. And again, this is spread in time because it's multiple lives. Okay? So we are immortal spirits. The, to my knowledge, the best example I can give it to you of mercifulness is we are here today, 2014, in November. 
We assassinated how many people in the past in our previous lives? We took how many lives? We did how many bad things? How many people we crucified? 500 a day. And instead of me having to be assassinated in my next 2,000 lives because I assassinated 2,000 people, I'm here today. Because there's a merciful God that gives me the opportunity to not really undo what I did in terms of an eye for an eye, but to offset what I do. In the past, I took lives, and now I'm going to take care of lives. I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to work on a daycare of poor kids that will not make it if somebody is not there for them. So I took lives, then I saved lives. It's not an eye for an eye. It's, it's, it's not really to pay. It's to offset. Okay. So here we are, 2014 Orlando. Mercifulness. God's, God's mercy. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. So besides everything we did, everything, in all life that we did, we're still here. Okay? That's how powerful this thing is. So coming back to the first question, why is there such a gap? Because I want it. That's the answer. Because it's my free will. Because I'm looking into both. Because when I look into that side, I don't see this. For example, in the last one hour, I've been speaking for one hour, us, right? In the last one hour, how many people thought about the war in Syria? Nobody. So we were looking for the last hour exclusively on that side, which automatically, if I'm looking here, I can't automatically be looking here. So I wasn't looking here. And when I go to the news, what happens? I'm going to get all hyper because of all the news and the way they promote the news and the marketing and agitated and, you know, the heart is all, the heart gets bitter for me. And then I forget about all that stuff. So why is such a gap? Because I want that gap. And how do I get out of it? I choose one side. Now there's a right side and a wrong side. When I choose the wrong side, I'm going to put a lot of suffering on my next lives. Okay. Thank you very much. Y'all have a good night.